The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Garnett Weber, and I am one of the founders of iTrax. We've been providing online qualitative software for the past 19 years. With the new General Data Protection Regulations, or GDPR, coming into effect on May 25, 2018, we have had many clients ask questions and request support with compliance. ITRAX is looking forward to providing the webinar, Security Best Practices During Online Qualitative Research. We will share recommendations on applying the GDPR articles to online qualitative research. We'll provide information on how to make use of some of the features within iTrack software to support compliance while conducting online qualitative research and some general security best practices. We do want to engage with you and answer your questions. As questions come up, please enter them into the chat area at the bottom of the GoToWebinar platform. We will have a question and answer session at the end of our webinar. Let's get started. The webinar presentation will be provided by Dan Weber, Candace Northey, and myself, Garnett. As president and CEO, Dan Weber has grown iTrax into the specialty online qualitative software and market research services firm it is today. Dan attended the University of Saskatchewan where he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree. He then acquired practical knowledge of traditional market research while working for a management consulting firm. It was while working at this firm he conceptualized the idea of taking traditional research methodologies online. In 1997, Dan founded iTrax, a pioneer in online surveys and online qualitative software. Dan has since built iTrax into the leading qualitative firm it is today. Dan has been instrumental in facilitating many of the world's leading research agencies and moderators to use and co-create iTrax qualitative platform. Dan's passion is bringing value to clients through innovation. Candice Northey, um, will also be presenting today. After graduating from the University of Saskatchewan with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology, Candace joined iTrax in early 2003. Candace has worked in quantitative research, quality control, and, and qualitative research and software services roles throughout her career at iTrax. In 2012, she took a leadership role managing the software services team at iTrax. Candice works with qualitative clients to coordinate and execute online focus groups and in-depth interviews. Both, um, oh sorry, Candice looks forward to sharing her extensive experience conducting online qualitative research, best practice options at all stages of an in-field project. Go ahead, Dan. Well, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, we started this uh, security uh, endeavor um, probably about six months ago when uh, the first rumblings of, of GDP, GDPR came up. And, and um, well, I believe that the start it would be a, a daunting task. I think um, after going through the experience, um, I find that it was very worthwhile, but uh, we certainly learned a lot about security, um, learned uh, beyond what we already offer, um, but then also just really getting a good understanding of, of how we can present um, our information, our software to uh, in a secure way to uh, clients, participants, um, and end and, and clients. So today we're going to talk a little bit about GDPR, uh, what it means, and, and uh, what was prepared on behalf of iTrax to, to, to become GDPR compliant. Um, Again, I wanted I wanted to point out that um, there's an awful lot of security elements and, and pieces and parts uh, to our software that go uh, far beyond uh, what was required in GDPR. I'll speak to those a bit, and then Candice will will um, then come in and, and talk a little bit about pe best practices and qualitative when we're when we're doing uh, uh, when you're managing um, online qualitative and then some security tips as well. So, so what is GDPR? Candice, I'll just get you to switch there. Yeah. So uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, it was implemented to create general protection uh, law framework across the EU. Its main aim was to give back uh, to data subjects control of their personal data. 
It also imposes strict rules on those hosting and processing the data from anywhere in the world. Ultimately, the end goal of GDPR is to make regulation easy for data controllers around the world to follow while maximizing the protection of data for EU residents. The note here is, if you are conducting research with any participants or clients in the EU, you must adhere to these rules now. So what does that require? So generally speaking, I'll get you to switch there again. Just next slide there for me. Oh, there we go. So in order to comply with GDPR, at minimum, one must get consent. Uh, now, this is a really important piece um, in that we studied quite, uh, quite a bit. A data controller must be able to provide that consent was given um, by the, the data subject. Uh, I think in the past, uh, researchers, um, obviously we've always gotten consent. The, the market research industry, I believe, um, has always been at the forefront of consent and security. And part of that um, is because we know that if we don't treat our participants well, if we don't uh, provide a, um, you know, a, a mechanism for them to give us their feedback truthfully and that they know that it's secure, then, then um, you know, obviously we will no longer have them um, or people willing to do research. So I would say, um, you know, with the rules around sugging and, and, and um, just not using that data for any other reason, research has kind of been at the forefront for this, but this, this goes beyond that. Um, the consent element, uh, one of the important pieces of this is that it's, it's not buried in a long list um, that's difficult to understand. It was very important that it was, um, that the consent portion is put in layman's terms. And so for that reason, um, we've actually um, reconstructed the consent piece that really talks about what the research might be used for, what their rights are beyond that, and how they can manage and use their data. And that's presented up front um, in um, in the screener process, in the first contact, um, before we have even gotten into the qualitative piece. And then it's it's reiterated throughout the process that at any point in time, they can say no to this and that the data can be erased and removed. Um, they then you know, can go into a more in-depth um, uh, uh, article that speaks to all the points on um, uh, on uh, privacy and, and and so on. But it's important that, you know, that first step that we talk to participants that they have, you know, a real good understanding of what the data is going to be used for. Um, we wanted to conduct a data protection impact assessment. It's important to assess privacy risks uh, of processing personal data for individuals. Um, it's also important and, and required that we appoint a data protections officer. Um, and that uh, I am now the data protection officer at ITRAX. Um, uh, you need to be prepared uh, for data breaches. There needs to be a, a, a document in place that speaks to if there's a data breach and what will happen um, 72 hours after that breach and, and what will take place. And then, of course, um, information and documentation around main, maintaining uh, records of processing. We'll go to the next slide. So, what did we have to do? Um, this was a, like I said, there was a bit of a process here. Um, it, it was a bit of work and it was daunting. It, it seemed daunting at the start because immediately when you talk about security, I think people think uh, computers and systems and, and hacking and, and, and a lot of security has to do with just, just general data management and how I'm managing that data and where it's being placed and, and what processes I'm using to uh, throughout the, the research. Um, one of the very important parts, if, if you haven't gone through the process of becoming GDPR compliant, uh, one of the first steps is just simply data mapping, getting a real good understanding of 
at what points or pieces could data lay. Now, in a, in a smaller organization, you may have a few, you have maybe a server and a, and a couple of desktops, maybe a laptop. It's understandable where that data may reside. In a bit larger organization, uh, you, you may have to go through um, some steps to get a good understanding of where where it can be. Now, I think one of the important pieces here was it, and in, in through our own discovery, is that sometimes it was unnecessary to have data in so many places. And so, you know, there's definitely a reason to to need it for backup purposes. But beyond that, uh, centralizing and, and and keeping your data in in given spots. Uh, not only allows you to to recall it or pick it up or find it if if need be, but it 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 really um, in our case it it allowed us to reduce the 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 um, uh, the IT requirement for storing data. Um, if we centralize it in certain places and parts, um, we we didn't need um, uh, other uh, other servers and 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 um, data storage places to store that data. Um, much of the GDPR work will be is will be dedicated to updating uh, the term your terms of use and privacy policies. This is really about informing the client and what their rights are, and uh, looking at what's required in those documents and, and updating updating them so that they're they're right. And then of course any agreements that you have with your clients, uh, they will need updating, uh, explaining to them. Um, what the course and process is. One of the interesting ones that came up in our discussion was if a participant asked to have their data removed, um, which of course they ha it, uh, we have to comply, um, we then have to talk to our client and say this must be removed from the research, um, even though it has been collected at that point. And so those are things that you need to have a discussion with your client up front so that they know if, if someone comes back and asks for their data removed, it, it uh, perhaps it's an IDI, perhaps it's part of a, uh, a video focus group. Um, we need to um, go through the process of removing that, um, and that, that no longer becomes uh, uh, something they can use for part of their research. Um, we had to update our procedures documents, so we talked uh, internally with, with our operations staff about what procedures are, are taken, where um, data is stored, how data is passed. One of the big things, this is a really important part, one of the big things that, that we had to discuss both with our staff but then also now discussing with our clients is um, how, do we, how do we pass data back and forth, and especially data that contains uh, PII. Uh, in the past, um, often it, you'd, uh, um, you'd attach it as a file and send it on its way, and clearly um, that, uh, that that can't be one of the best practices now, and and, and needs to, and certainly needed to be addressed. Um, and of course, some of that isn't just in training the client. Um, you have to talk to them about, uh, you know, these. This is a method by which we we pass data. Uh, it's in a secure site uh, that you have to log into and that you can pick up that data. I'll be fair. Um, some of our clients, um, you know, it's always a balance between security and convenience. Um, but um, you know, with today's um, the pressure with with re respect to security, it's it's um, it's something that you have to train your client as well. Um, there was a lot of work that we had to do with uh, training our staff um, and just making sure that they're following the protocols. And then, um, as I mentioned before, there's some discussions with clients that need to take place. It talks a little bit about how uh, GDPR affects both the research pr uh, data and then also the processes that we follow. Out of all this, I would say it was a good experience. I feel like uh, ITRAX and I think many others in the research industry are better prepared. I think that much of the practices that, that were implemented, will we will be implementing universally, um, regardless of whether we're doing work in the EU. Um, it's good for the participant. I think they're more informed. Uh, they know what the data is being used for. Uh, they have the option to opt out, or opt out early. Um, 
they understand what data is being collected, uh, why we may need their PII. Um, you know, often uh, PII is, is, is required simply for sending incentives um, or just simply to be able to communicate with the people um, throughout the process. Uh, so I have your email address and phone number so I can get a hold of you um, throughout the process. Really, market research beyond that, um, there isn't an awful re a lot of reason to have that information. Um, the participant understands who has access to it, and they have uh, the, an understanding of their en enhanced privacy rights. So they, they can um, change or modify their information. They can ask for it to be erased, and that they know that there's a process for doing that. I think it's good for the client. Um, they have security in knowing the data will be managed well, one of the things that that we deal with, and, and I'm certain others do as well, is uh, often we get asked about our security um, protocols and our guidelines, and sometimes that can be a struggle. We can be sent 45-page security documents that, that our staff and, and, and legal counsel have to review and go through, and it can be arduous and somewhat daunting in some cases, especially if there's differences in requirements but from different companies. I think by having and saying you're GDPR compliant, I think many of those um, of that can be removed and it can be a much shorter inquiry with regards to security. Uh, so I think that's, that's good for both the client and ourselves. Um, and I think generally uh, there's better protocols here at iTrax now and, and there's a far greater re, uh, reduced chance of breaches or data loss. And quite frankly, I think now we, you know, through this process, we've discovered places to save some money and time. And um, I think that it'll be uh, worthwhile in that capacity. I did want to speak a little bit about security beyond GDPR. Um, one of the things I found myself saying is, you know, this is important, but, uh, you know, these, the, when, we're, when looking at these protocols and, and work that we're doing with the GDPR, but there's, I said, there's an awful lot of security elements that, that aren't addressed in this um, that we've been, you know, implementing through, you know, th through other requests that I'm not certain uh, the industry is necessarily adhering to, and but I do think they are important. Um, so, you know, one of the things I came up with, basically, a, a, you know, a, a list of questions that I think if you're using, if you're doing qualitative research, you should be asking your provider these types of questions. And and I'll just go through them. So, are, are password required to access the software? Um, you know, this is this seems obvious to me, but what I, my understanding is that in some cases, they're not. Um, do participants, clients, and researchers create their own passwords? Um, you know, I, I hear of people saying, you know, you know, general security process now requires people to create their own passwords, and and if they forget them, they 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 recreate them. People can't call iTrax and say, "Well, it's my password." Uh, we don't have that information, and nor do we want it. Um, so, it, you know, we developed in our Go platform, um, you know, the kind of the general guidelines for creating and, and securing um, your projects and your participants through password protection. Um, does your vendor um, provide open links to access their video focus group software without the need of, for username and password credentials? The answer to this should be never. Um, this comes back to, you know, and we've had some um, some clients come to us and say, you know, um, the the software provider that I've used in the past, they just send me a link or they just send per participants a link and that's how they access it. This this goes back to that convenience for, versus security um, element. If your provider is providing you links that do, go directly to your your project or, or platform, I highly recommend you, you change your provider uh, because it certainly doesn't meet some of the security guidelines or, or most of the guidelines that I have seen provided by um, uh, you know, our clients, our requirements by our clients. So uh, it's certainly something to control. Obviously, those links can be passed to anyone and people can access that, um, that given project. 
do your uh, do you email your own vendors uh, with client and participant PI who then book your project and set them up? Um, this should be never as well. You should be able to book your own projects. You should be able to set up your own participants and your vendors with their information, especially your clients. Some of these clients are, are high-end clients. Their email addresses and phone numbers, um, I'm certain they wouldn't want them um, to be passed around um, to other providers. You should be able to do this all within your own, um, within your uh, the, the, the software that you're using. Does each interview have their own unique conference line and interview room, uh, removing risk of participant or client overlap and security breach? I've heard of clients booking uh, a single room uh, on a single line and people coming in, if a, if a, a project goes late, people coming in partway through the interview. Obviously, this is a major security breach. Uh, if you're talking about sensitive topics, please use a vendor that has unique conference lines and interview rooms uh, when doing this type of work. And then, of course, where is the data being stored? Is it in a secured environment? Um, yeah. But those are, those are simple questions you can ask your, your software provider. Um, and, and those are the answers they should be providing. So, uh, Beyond that, um, I think I'm going to pass the controls over to uh, Candice here. Uh, she's going to talk about just um, the general process of, of managing um, uh, online qualitative and the security elements that, that uh, both we provide and what others uh, should be adhering to. Candice? Hi, everyone. So um, now that Dan's gone over uh, what the GDPR is kind of as an overview uh, and what it is and what ITAX has been doing to become GDPR compliant, um, I wanted to really focus on what you as a researcher uh, should be doing during a typical research study to ensure that you are also GDPR compliant. Um, if you think about it, and Dan mentioned this as well, um, there's a lot of things with good research practices that overlap in this new privacy policy. Um, a lot of things around consent and um, and privacy and, and things like that. There's, like I said, just a lot of overlap between them. Um, so here, what I'm hoping to do is help you move those ideas into practice within our own software in particular. Um, as you, I'm sure everybody knows, uh, all the IPAC software allows for a private research environment where only those people set up and invited are actually able to, uh, to access the study. And within that software, you can allow people to see responses others and not limit access to certain information as needed. Um, so what that means is that ITRAX via their software is actually managing a lot of that for you. Um, and what I want to focus on is how you as a moderator can, can kind of manage that um, outside of what ITRAX can do. So what your responsibility is in managing that data. Um, so there's two main uh, things uh, that, that you would have to manage yourself. And that is managing the personal data that is disclosed in your study uh, via your participants, um, making sure that they aren't seeing uh, each other's personal data in particular, and then storage and transfer of your data uh, post-project. So the first thing to look at is what are, what are you doing uh, with the personal data pre and during study? When I talk about personal data, of course, is personal data, data being disclosed by your participants. Um, the first one, uh, the most obvious one, is the display name, is something that you want to be paying attention to. Um, this is the name that corresponds with the participants' responses in the discussion area of your study. And it is most important to pay attention to in group situations, of course. But you do recommend uh, following certain procedures with the display name um, in any situation. Um, and that, in particular, is never use the participant's full name. You just want to make sure that full names are never used as display name, even though you have cases where participants don't see, um, so maybe you're doing an IDI and participants don't see that full name, you still don't want to be disclosing that to observers. So that's something we're telling all of our clients now is just to never use full names, just use um, pseudonyms or first name, last initial. Some people are even going further and always using pseudonyms under the GDPR to ensure that privacy um, of their participants. Uh, 
Um, and then just one thing to note is just within our software, you can have a pseudonym that is different, and then there is a full name area that only moderators and above see. So if you do need to have that full name to reach out to the participants by email using the broadcaster, you still have the ability. Um, and then the second is collection of personally identifiable data right within the discussion. So um, one thing that we've seen in past projects is um, in particular in regard, particularly in regards to um, incentive information, so information you need for incentives like your full name and your address um, or email address if you're doing inside the slide of PayCal. Um, those are things that you shouldn't be asking directly within the discussion. Um, even if you are making the questions private, you do request now that you do that outside of the research or in the profiles where other people can't see it. So you want to make sure that those are uh, things that you're thinking of and you're, you're not asking those questions anymore um, for, for people to, to be putting information there. Best practice is using an online uh, survey or you know getting your recruiters to get it before the, the study happens so it's just not in in the software uh, there's no chance of it being exposed to other people and then um, the third part is recognizing and flagging uh, personal data within your board um, so for this what I want to show you is just kind of some examples that you might find of personal data in your board personal data isn't necessarily um, just the PII that we've talked about in the past. It can be a combination of items that identify somebody. So um, there's the obvious things like, for example, and I'm just going to bring up my screen here to show you. So I'm going to log in as John M here. And the reason I'm logging in as John, because I just want to show you the, the procedure that people do need to use to log in. Um, and it also will show you the new terms of use. So I'm just going to quickly go through this one here. And so here's the new, new terms of use. Uh, it's laid out uh, a lot more nicely, so it's a lot more readable. And it has links to our new privacy statements um, that are very, um, that are quite itemized and they, they they're very, um, they're laid out a lot more nicely than, than they once were, and it has a lot more detail on, including who to get a hold of and how to, uh, how to get rid of your data if you if you need to. Um, back to the participant screen here. Just I just clicked on that privacy statement here. Just scroll down. We've laid it out quite nicely. Um, if it's opening like this, uh, so participants have to look at it before they go into the board, they do have to scroll down and read through it before accepting um, and getting into the actual discussion. Um, I'm just going to skip past the demographics here and just go straight to the discussion question. And what I wanted to show you here is just an example of what you might find um, where somebody, you know, would accidentally put some, you know, personal data in the board. So. So I'm just going to type in a full name. So and I'm just going to post that slide. So I mostly did that just so I could show you the, the participant view and the terms of use and how they replied. I'm going to go back to the moderator view and I'm just going to click here. And I'm just going to show you some things that you can do, some examples of, of personal value you might find in the board. So John here. He actually put his full name. So that's something that you might find um, if, in response to an introductory question, for example. Um, and that might be just something that, um, that you see as you're going through. So as such, one of the things you can do, there's a number of things you can do. You can edit a person's response quite easily within the board. Just go and edit it, and maybe you'll go and just change it so, you know, that it's just their first name again. Um, you could also, um, if you wanted to, you had the option here to make it private so other people didn't see it. So maybe there was a piece of information you wanted to keep for your study. You didn't mind the observer seeing it. You just wanted to make it private instead. Um, you could do that. I do have a couple other uh, 
things in this in this study that um, you might you know want to be aware of as well. So, for example, charity here. You might notice that charity, um, where she puts her pictures of fertilizer, she has a picture of a sign saying "Welcome to the Smith Family Union." So now she's accidentally disclosed her last name and and her identity. She also has on her on her avatar here a Team Smith sweater. So she's obviously her last name is Smith, and you don't want to disclose that to the rest of your participants. So you want to manage that as well. And you, we do give you options to you know delete out and once again make private. And then with the profiles, we even give you the option to go into people's profiles and edit this. You could also get a hold of charity and, and, and tell her, hey, you know, this is what I've done. Can you replace your your details? Another example would just be in regards to the response that that people have. Um, so, for example, Mary Lou here has responded to charity about some sculptures in her yard, and she said, "I'd love to have sculptures in my yard, but the Wild Rose Community Homeowners Association of Alaska have banned them." So she's basically told everybody where she lives and really identified herself in this case. Once again, you can go in and you can edit and delete. And then if you do find there's a certain question overall that you're having problems with, you know, everyone's disclosing something in this question, or you feel that even when you're doing the setup, you feel that they might be disclosing something in this question, we do have the ability to change the question types while the study's running. So for example, I've decided where pictures of where I put my, where I put my fertilizer should no longer be uninfluenced where other people don't see it. I could just go in and edit my question. Wait a second. And change it to interview mode. So now, regardless of what people post there, if it has pictures of people or pets or anything that's going to be problematic, I can go ahead and I can um, I can have it so so other people can't see it, and it's it's own. I really only have to worry about the data disclosed to the the observers and the the moderators. Um, and so, just kind of the things that I just showed you there, just to kind of go over the different things you can do to manage that personal data that's disclosed in the board. Um, of course, you can edit responses, making private, removing details if you need to, change your question types, and then flagging and monitoring questions. And this is something that you you might want to do um, for pre, during, and post study items in terms of transferring the data back to your clients as needed. Um, so one of the things I recommend is just flagging certain questions that might have personal data in them to maybe remove them from your transcripts when you're doing the download if you're sharing them with your clients um, or sharing it with anybody outside or a outside the research team if you ever need to for whatever reason. Um, that way you can make sure that personal data isn't going out uh, beyond your control um, if possible. Um, and to do that, there's a number of ways to do that. You can kind of, as time goes on, you might notice, oh, there's certain questions that I always get personal data in. So it's quite easy just when you're doing the, the transcripts to take off certain questions and only supply the data that you need to. Um, now, I know when I was writing this up, I was like, I was worried, okay, does this mean that you're not able to ask certain questions anymore? I don't think that's the case. Um, I don't think it limits your online research. You just really have to be aware and kind of cognizant that if there is personal data in your in your study, you have to make a decision on how to do that if it stays in there and if it's able to be transferred uh, beyond the study itself. Um, the other thing um, that you have to contend with is just transferring and storage of data. So. When transferring data, and this is something that Dan has mentioned, and we're really just trying to educate clients in general on this, um, I put up a list of do's and don'ts. So don't use USB sticks or other portable memory bank devices. Um, if they ever get misplaced or mishandled, there's the data. Um, and 
on that stick and who knows where it is. You really want to keep track of where your data is and uh, these types of devices don't lend well to that. Um, do log into secure networks only. So um, I know that a lot of, especially a lot of moderators travel um, and they tend to log into open Wi-Fi networks on planes or in coffee shops. Um, we do not recommend doing that when you're dealing with any sort of personal data like uh, you might like you might find in a discussion board or uh, any other type of research study. Um, and the problem with open networks is that they're quite easy to hack and it's quite easy uh, for people that know what they're doing to spy on you. Um, do not use email to transfer files and other PII details. Um, instead, use a secure transfer site. Do use a secure site for research. So if you're using our tool, of course, it's, it's secure. Uh, but make sure that, uh, that the sites that you are using for research are secure. And then do vet your vendors. So ask them security questions. Make sure if you are working with EU, EU clients in particular that you, they are GDPR compliant. And then in terms of data storage, this is going to be also important. So one thing that Dan had mentioned is that now under the new GDPR, the participants have the right to be um, to be forgotten or the right to erasure. So um, the best way to do this is just to make keep track of where your data is stored for easy removal. So um, you just want to make sure that there is a data map um, somewhere at your company. And this is just as simple as, oh, I have my files in this folder for this project. Um, uh, or it can be a little bit more um, uh, more technical, of course, if you do have an IT department, they'll be able to tell you exactly where things are stored and delete as needed. Um, set a retention policy. Um, if you're a researcher that has done research for many, many years, one thing you might want to consider is just uh, getting rid of old, old projects um, so there is no PII uh, left on any computer or device that you might have uh, just in case. And then password protect your documents. So that's something that's really important too. It's quite easy to do if you do have, um, you know, a smaller company. Um, that might be an easy solution in some cases is to just have your, your doctor's password protected, especially those containing email addresses, uh, full names, and um, uh, any other sort of PII. I did want to show you one last thing on the uh, on the iTrack site here too. So one of the things that you might find now is that you will be required to uh, certain clients of yours, if they're really cognizant about GDPR, they might ask you to delete uh, data based on retention policies they have themselves. So we have a two-year retention policy, but there are a lot of clients now that have shorter windows, like it might be 30 days or um, uh, six months or what have you. You do have the option at iTrax as well to go in and delete your own data. So if you do have a client that says, hey, you know those uh, focus groups that I ran last year, I'd like them deleted, you know, two weeks after the, I would like all project data deleted after the project's done. And here's how you can go do this. So I'm just in as a uh, Go user, um, I think I'm a client manager, and then I get a list of all my projects, and I can go in and I can just go, and I now have the option to go and delete my activities. So if I go and I just delete this, it will give me a, a thing saying, gee, are you sure you want to delete it? And so I delete, um, delete it out. I have to put the right word in. So it doesn't make you let you automatically delete it. It does have a little bit of a fail safe in there, you know, for those that are worried about that. But you can go in and you can delete, uh, put the right, you have to put the right name in, and that's what I did not do there. Um, and that is it for my side. So I'll let Dan take over again. 
actually, I, uh, Garnett here, I'll be doing the next, next uh, section here. So we just have a uh, some uh, brief over, overview of privacy risks and best practices and tips. So GDPR does require organizations to conduct a data protection impact assessment. And it's important for all parties involved in the online qualitative research process to as assess risks of processing personal data of individuals involved in this process. And depending on the size of the organization, again, this can really vary. Uh, we do have some tips, uh, uh, not from a, a huge IT infrastructure um, perspective, but many of the people joining the webinar today are qualitative market researchers. And it's important uh, we ourselves uh, assess the risks uh, that we may be posing to that uh, personal information. So go, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, key recommendations is to educate, educate yourself on system security best practices. Many organizations have very advanced security policies. It's very important to follow those and verify that your systems are being updated in a timely manner. Uh, there is, um, uh, ITRAX has uh, done a lot um, over the many, uh, many years and especially recently with this to really assess our security. Um, we have done, uh, we have uh, regular penetration tests where uh, security is being checked to make sure that uh, we don't have uh, to avoid any security loopholes or uh, risks with our systems. Um, uh, we have reviewed many of our security policies and educated our staff to make sure that uh, those are being followed. And we recommend as individuals that um, uh, people ensure that uh, their individual devices are meeting the security policies of their, um, of their organizations. Uh, there are many operating systems that have methods to automatically update, um, and uh, these regular updates will help to enhance your security. Uh, next, I'll touch on antivirus applications. Uh, we highly recommend because you'll be accessing uh, software using your, your uh, computers and devices, we recommend that uh, you use a, uh, um, a high, um, like a regular brand or recognized antivirus uh, software that's up to date, make sure that it's running, and also take caution regarding which devices you are connecting to your online qualitative platform. Uh, make sure that uh, they have these updated antivirus um, uh, softwares in place and that, um, uh, if possible, that you're connecting through a secure network. Uh, next slide. Uh, so then in terms of accessing the network, uh, Candace did touch on this a bit. Um, uh, when accessing uh, the uh, inter accessing online qualitative software using a browser, it's important to be very cautious um, with open or public Wi-Fi uh, connections. So uh, open or public Wi-Fi connections that are available in airports and coffee shops are not secure. Uh, people can uh, uh, view what is taking place. So it definitely would be not um, recommended to be doing anything with uh, respondent personal information in that type of setting. Um, the uh, When you're traveling, be aware of the network names you're connecting to. These can be spoofed. So people can uh, make a uh, fake Starbucks uh, network and call it, uh, call it, rename it slightly different. And then you, um, you have to make sure that you're not connecting to that because that could be giving them direct access. Uh, we're recommending that people don't have their mobile devices set to automatically connect to public networks. Uh, this uh, this uh, does not give you this, the degree of control that you need. You need to know if you're connecting and if you are on a public network that you're uh, cautious what type of um, tasks that you're doing. Uh, we recommend that you're using current uh, browser versions that you check. Uh, with browser updates come a lot of uh, security enhancements, so always try to stay up to date as possible. And if you do have to uh, use a public device um, uh, to do some type of um, uh, work in online qualitative, definitely recommend that you're in the incognito or private mode. 
Uh, and um, and then lastly, just a few tips around email considerations. Uh, if possible, uh, use a virtual private network. This technology will allow remote users to send and receive data uh, as if their devices were connected to the private uh, network and it'll give you the benefit from your organization's security um, uh, features. In general, uh, email is not uh, secure, so we highly recommend um, that um, you're not emailing highly sensitive information and that uh, if you do need to um, uh, transfer secure uh, uh, private uh, personal information of respondents or any personal information that you use a secure file sharing option. And iTrax does offer that. We can send you a link that you can basically click on and then upload that uh, secure information so that it can be um, uh, uh, shared in an encrypted way uh, that, um, that it is much more secure. And then um, the just in terms of um, uh, best practices, be very cautious when downloading uh, files from emails, especially from people that you don't uh, recognize or emails you're not expecting, and uh, with um, a lot of um, uh, uh, phishing emails and um, uh, different security risks. Uh, we just uh, want to alert everyone to be cautious with that. All right, and that is the end of the general security tips and assessing risks. Uh, so we'll now move into our question and answer session. Uh, we have a number of questions that people have posed, and uh, we will uh, uh, move forward to uh, um, uh, bringing or uh, asking those to the group, and then uh, and sharing answers to those. Please feel free to um, uh, post your questions in the chat area at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. Okay. Hey, Oh, hi. hi yes. Here. Um, I can, I, I'm looking at some of the questions now, so I can start going through them and, and, and taking it from there, if that's all right. Sounds good. Yep. Go ahead, Dan. Excellent. Um, so we have a question here. Any pr predictions about whether and when GDPR will become law in North America? So I, I can't say that I'm a soothsayer with, with respect to this, but um, in light of what has happened, uh, uh, um, you know, with things like Facebook, uh, and it seems like almost on a, a weekly or monthly basis, there's some security issues. My prediction is yes, uh, some form and fashion, maybe not uh, exactly similar to what these guidelines are saying, I do believe will be will, will be um, coming our way uh, in North America. And, and what I can say is. Um, after going through the experience, don't be overwhelmed. Like, don't be so concerned that you won't be able to get through this process. It's, and in, in general, it, it is good process. It will help um, your organization in terms of management and, and, and following security elements. So yes, I do think how, how long, probably sooner than later. I'm going to guess within the first year, or within a year's time, there's going to be some new form. It will also help you um, because you're going to continue to get security questions. Um, I think if you can say, I adhere to these general policies that were laid out, um, you're, you won't necessarily have so many concerns or issues as it, with respect to security, because right now it's, it's a little bit willy-nilly. It's, it's people kind of asking questions everywhere. Uh, another question here, what are record, uh, just a second here, what do we have? Uh, are these regulations uh, global or just for certain regions, countries? So the they're just for the EU, but I want to point out that if you're doing work with anyone in the EU, then they apply. Um, and again, I think some of them are good practice. So that you know, if if you're thinking about it. You, going through this process would be worthwhile, um, and, you know, working on adhering to them and, and regardless of what projects you're working on. And oh, just to sorry, just to jump in here, uh, it's very it's um, uh, very specific in that if it um, it doesn't uh, I, the important piece is if the participants of the research are located anywhere in the EU, then it definitely would apply to your study. Exactly. Um, yeah, you say participants, uh, but 
isn't this currently just a concern for EU prisons? If one, uh, if I, if the, I only work with US, do we need to have this level of concern? Uh, again, um, you know, coming back to my point, um, you don't necessarily have to adhere to these guidelines, but I think the majority of the processes are good practice, and uh, you'll likely be getting, um, you know, f uh, you know questions from your client, are you adhering to these types of practices? So um, the, the big one that I find is the passing of, of information. That's really where it comes down to, because yeah, at some point you need to pass information back and forth between the client. And does it contain PII, number one? And then number two is if it does, is it done in a secure way? I, I guess as, as researchers, we are going to, um, you know, at, at least at the onset, we're going to have to understand that, you know, that we are going to have to give up some convenience to adhere to these policies. I think my challenge as a software provider then is to then develop platforms and systems where perhaps this information can be contained and there isn't a need to continue to pass information. So for instance, if I can re uh, build uh, your uh, effectively a recruit grid within our secured system so that it doesn't have to be passed. You simply, within your Go system, you log in and you see that information. Then that eliminates the need to be pushing information back and forth. So those are, those are some of the things that we are um, that we are addressing and, and, and we'll be working on as a software sub provider in the coming months. Um, and so you can look forward to some of those types of things as it relates to security. So, any other questions, Garnett? That um, I uh, here's one. What are records of processing exactly? Could you provide an example so I can expand on that? Uh, so, part of the GDPR um, uh, requires you to maintain um, the clear records of processing, and so an example would be. Uh, of processing would be personal data collection, how it's being managed, how it's being stored, uh, how and when it's being transferred and to whom. And so all of these records uh, have to be maintained and, um, and um, this documentation could be requested by a supervising authority at any time, especially, let's say, in the case of a data breach um, that would be reported. And so then you'd, it would be important to have a record of um, uh, all of these processing activities. Uh, so hopefully that uh, helps to clarify that question. In our case, um, because we have... Um, you know, more sophisticated network, much of this is managed in logs. Um, that, again, um, you can speak to your software provider um, or your systems provider and, and talk a little bit about what their logging systems are so that you know and understand when data, where, when data has been passed or processed. Um, there is a question here. Um, on, uh, you said to only use secure networks and not to use unsecured Wi-Fi, like in coffee shops, planes, hotels, etc. So, what are the options in those uh, those locations? Uh, 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 Todd, would you like to speak to this one? Uh, Todd is our systems administrator. Yes, I sure can. Uh, so, really, your best option is to not do anything that could potentially uh, cause a security breach. That may not always be possible. Um, so next best option would be if you're in a unsecure, or unknown uh, Wi-Fi, use a VPN, so virtual private network, uh, to you know, attach to your normal business if that's a, a possibility. Um, Really, the best answer there is just avoid uh, passing along PII or, or doing secure operations. Todd, is one of the, would one of the options be to use a, 
a personal hotspot with your data. Like obviously that's one of the reasons why you don't want to necessarily be, you know, you want to be using a Wi-Fi so you're not using your data, but um, would that be an option as well? Oh, certainly. Yeah. If you uh, wanted to do that instead of an unsecured Wi-Fi, you would be in a better spot. Okay. Very good. So is that all the questions we have for today, Garnett? Uh, uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, yeah, please feel free to add them here. Um, there is a question here. You say participants, but isn't this currently just a concern with EU participants? If one works only in the US, do we need to have this level of concern? Uh, so uh, that's correct. So if, if the uh, participants in your research are only located in the US, then the GDPR would not uh, apply to you. If, um, um, yeah, if you are only um, uh, managing PII from people personal information from people that are located in the U.S. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate everyone joining in today. If additional questions come up, we'd be very happy to work with you to, uh, to answer them and to help train you on any features or um, uh, functions that you need to utilize within our software to be compliant. And we wish you all the best as, you, uh, as we, go, we all go together to support each other in this uh, new era of um, privacy with respect to online qualitative research. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Dan and Candice and Todd. Thank you, Garnett, and have a great day, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye.